Today, our focus on supporting collaborative research projects will include clarifying scientific objectives, developing NIH grant applications and biomedical protocols, and in order to develop a competitive NIH grant application, I will also describe NIH review criteria and review procedures. When working with collaborators, it is important to clarify the study objectives of their project. Unfortunately, collaborators rarely, if ever, present their study objectives as inferential statistical problems. It is up to you, the statistician, to get your collaborator to eventually verbalize precisely what their study objectives are. It does help if you have relevant background information. For that reason, statisticians who concentrate in specific areas of public health or medicine can become extremely valuable members of the scientific team, and they can even lead collaborative research. In fact, in the university setting, some academic units hire their own statisticians. Likewise, pharmaceutical companies often assign statisticians to specific disease areas. Having the necessary background information, you can then translate the collaborators, collaborators objectives and research problems into statistical terms. Some strategies to increase your effectiveness in working on collaborative projects include getting involved at the planning stages of the project. Of course, this requires that your collaborators understand and value your role in the scientific process and thoughtfully loop you into early discussions. I previously mentioned the importance of background knowledge. The more understanding you have in the field, the better prepared you will be to provide insights and offer suggestions of the research design. Of course, asking your collaborators to provide relevant publications is always a very good first strategy. Learning to navigate online resources, such as PubMed and up-to-date searches that are provided by the Health Sciences Library can be valuable too. For statisticians who work in large-scale consulting centers, such as OSU's Center for Clinical Translational Research, which supports campus-wide research, developing your skills in the art of questioning is vital. That is, it is important to learn how to ask probing questions to extract the relevant information from your collaborators. These all serve to help you help your collaborator to clarify their study objectives. If you recall from our productive conversations module, much of these activities fall into the understanding type of conversations. Once you agree to work on a specifically outlined scientific project, be sure to be aware of resource constraints. In particular, when is your work to be completed? Without the when ingredient, you will have an incomplete performance conversation. Of course, Always acknowledge when you need more time to do or reach a specific solution. Stephanie Schulte and Danny Dotson from OSU Libraries already provided a nice overview of online resources and searching techniques. Please refer back to the material posted under week five, which includes materials on how to keep an annotated bibliography. Here I additionally pointed out some additional software resources, including the rseq.org website, which is a great web search engine that can be used for finding relevant R function functions and packages. Also, this site sponsored by UCLA has a software link for tutorials for R, SAS, Stata, and other various software packages. Here are some specific roles to help you clarify the objectives and hypotheses of a research study. Rule one, understand what the, what the investigator plans to measure and why. Find out whether there is any prior information about likely effects. Be sure to understand the meaning of each variable. For example, in a kidney transplant data set I was given, one variable is labeled pump time, which is recorded in minutes. After harvesting a deceased donor kidney, the organ can be put into a machine or pump such that the kin kidney continues to function and in fact produces urine. There was a very wide range on pump times recorded, ranging from zero to a very large number. Of course, for patients for whom zero was recorded was their recorded pump time, in fact, their donor organ was not put on a pump. 
Therefore, there really should have been a dichotomous variable basically labeled pump versus no pump. And then for those deceased donor organs that were put on the pump, their time should have been recorded. And a missing value should have appeared for those who were not put on a pump. Understand the units of measurement. Is height recorded in inches or meters? Did the investigators already log transform a known skewed variable? Understand the meaning of special symbols. The delta delta CT is a quantity frequently reported for quantitative reverse polymerase chain reactions and represents the change in the change from the cycle threshold. Know whether similar experience, experiments have been carried out before. Such data can provide valuable data for specifying the planned sample size. To obtain these key ingredients, consult and collaborate with the subject matter experts. Rule two, decide on the optimal design for the study. Keep the design and analysis straightforward. Be sure to clearly specify whether your data collection procedure is an experimental design, a survey sample, or an observational study. If you are designing an experiment, be sure to clarify the treatment groups and randomization process. When conducting a survey, be sure to describe the planned statistical analysis to mimic the design of the survey. Perhaps you are doing a stratified cluster sample. The analytical plan should include survey weights. For observational studies, limitations should be considered and alternative strategies for analysis explored. Perhaps methods for causal inference would be useful to control for confounding co covariates. I was at ENAR in 2010 and Hulun Wu, now at University of Texas, said, the National of Institutes of Health puts big money into new biomedical technologies. Why not on new biostatistical techniques? Data are useless or may be abused if no statistical methodologies are available. While NIH has for some time and continues to fund biostatistical methodological developments, I believe he was arguing that money set aside for methods pales in comparison to other funded research efforts. However, as far back as 2002, Louise Ryan said in an Amstat News article, these days, successful grant writing ranks alongside teaching and research as an indicator of success in the academic environment. One way as students you can get experience in grant writing is to apply for an individual pre-doctoral fellowship. The F31 fellowship is for domestic pre-doctoral scholars. There's also a mechanism to enhance diversity. More information about NIH fellowship opportunities is provided here, which also includes postdoctoral fellowship op opportunities such as the F32 and the F99 slash R00 mechanism. Let's first focus on NIH grant applications for applied clinical and public health research. After you have clarified the study objectives, a planned statistical analysis must be clearly articulated. You will need to formulate the research hypothesis in statistical terms. Be sure to know what data can be collected to address the research questions. Sometimes you will need to ensure that these data are feasible to collect. For example, in a radiological study that was being cut, conducted to compare a new device to existing radiological techniques, patients were asked to visit the medical center multiple times, and at each visit, patients were scanned using four different devices. While well-designed and thorough with respect to the planned comparisons, this study was too time-consuming for patients, so patients either dropped out or they just refused to enroll. The result was that the protocol was shut down due to lack of enrollment. Considering the expected structure of the data, plan a detailed statistical analysis. Be sure that the planned statistical analysis is consistent with the research hypothesis. Also, be sure that the sample size calculation method matches the eventual planned statistical analysis method. For example, if the hypothesis pertains to a survival outcome, don't use a two-sample t-test for calculating the required sample size. It is also useful to propose alternative plans. For example, propose how you will handle study drops out, dropouts or missing data. The format for most NIH grant applications is the same. The specific aims are detailed first, 
and that is limited to one page. This specific AIMS page should describe the background that motivates your proposed research study. It should be very compelling as reviewers not assigned to review your entire application may focus only on this one page. Here you want to start with the literature and identify an important gap in the knowledge. The research strategy is limited to six pages for small grant applications like RO3s and R21s and to 12 pages for larger grant applications like RO1s and projects within a program project grant. The research strategy is usually subdivided into sections that describe the significance of the project or, in other words, the scientific premise of the proposal. The innovation of the proposed research and the approach is the largest component of the research strategy. The approach should precisely describe how each specific aim will be carried out. In this section, be sure to use future tense verbs. The approach section can describe any data sets you plan to analyze to satisfy the specific aims. If you're, you are submitting an R01 or a larger grant application, it is very important to report supporting or preliminary data. Supporting data show experiments and analysis done to a publishable standard and may include references to previous publications. Truly preliminary data have not yet reached the publishable level, but they can be important to include to demonstrate that the study is feasible. Supporting or preliminary data are not required for small grant applications, such as RO3s or R21s, <clears throat> but if provided, they can be critiqued, so make sure that your preliminary data is strong. The end of the approach section usually includes a project timeline. This can be a few sentences, but is more commonly a Gantt chart. Here's an example of a Gantt chart from my current RO3 funded by the National Cancer Institute. As you can see, I have indicated what tasks associated with my specific aims will be completed over the two years of the funding and which each specific task will be completed. So to prepare a competitive ap application, it is essential to know how your grant will be evaluated. Assigned reviewers provide numerical scores to the following criteria, significance, investigators, innovation, approach, and environment. After considering those five areas jointly, an overall impact score is provided. Scores to each criteria are from a, on a one to nine scale, with one indicating a perfect application and nine indicating a very poor application. Recommended strategies provided by scientific review officers, those are the people who organize the study sections, are to start each application essentially in the middle at a criterion of five, and then move more towards a one or towards a nine, depending upon the strengths or the weaknesses of the grant application. Let's talk about specific scoring criteria. For significance, reviewers are asked, is there a strong scientific premise for the project? Does the project address an important problem or a critical barrier to progress in the field? If the aims of the project are achieved, how will scientific knowledge, technical capability, and or clinical practice be improved? How will successful completion of the aims change the concepts, methods, technologies, treatments, services, or preventative interventions that drive this field? No, an application does not need to have a direct link to health or a specific specific health outcome to have significance. So for example, we can propose methods development and demonstrate that they can be applied to health-related data. Additionally, data collection, cataloging, and cohort building are resource development projects that can be funded by NIH. Investigators are the principal investigator, collaborators, and other research staff well suited to the project? Early stage investigators are those within 10 years of receipt of their terminal degree. New stage investigators are those who have not had previously held a major NIH award. 
new and early stage investigators are still evaluated as to whether or not they have appropriate training or experiment experience, but NIH staff use a more generous pay line for them when doling out funds. Investigators should demonstrate an ongoing record of accomplishments. If the application is led by multiple principal investigators, the investigator should have complementary and integrated expertise. Also, an additional document, a multi-PI plan, is required which verbalizes the leadership approach. And item, items such as how disputes should be resolved, um, my current R01 funded by the National Institutes of Diabetes, Digestive, and Kidney Diseases is a multiple PI grant. I'm the biostatistician and my co-PI is a biochemist. Innovation. Does the application challenge and seek to shift current research and clinical practice paradigms by utilizing novel theoretical concepts, approaches, or methodologies, instrumentation, or interventions? Are the concepts, approaches, or methodologies, instrumentation, or interventions novel to one field of research or novel in a broad sense? Is a refinement, improvement, or new application of theoretical concepts, approaches, or methodologies, instrumentation, or interventions proposed? Unfortunately, innovation is an area that can bring down the overall impact of your score, mostly because science, by its nature, is incremental. So commonly you want to focus on your research being an a refinement or an improvement, unless you do have really cutting edge science. Approach. The approach score is most correlated to the overall impact score. For each aim, you should think about outlining the aims rationale, specific activities to be completed, their expected outcomes, and potential problems in alternative approaches. One area that can impact approach in a negative way is if you have not well addressed protection of human subjects from research risks or clearly articulated how sex as a biological variable will be accounted for in the planned analyses. Also, many reviewers want to see that racial and ethnic composition of the study subjects to ensure that they are representative so that results will be broadly generalizable. Environment. Most large R1 institutions receive good scores on environment. If you are proposing work with researchers outside your institution, the environment score can negatively be affected unless you demonstrate a history of successful past collaborations or solid collaborative plans. Environment can also be negatively effective if you don't supply adequate details about facilities available. For example, if you're proposing to perform analyses of high throughput sequencing data, you will want to describe access to supercomputer resources like those at the Ohio Supercomputer Center that will help your overall environment score. Overall impact. Reviewers will provide an overall impact score to reflect their assessment of the likelihood for the project to exert a sustained powerful influence on the research field involved in consideration of the following review criteria and additional review criteria as described. That is, considering the significance, investigators, innovation, approach, and environment, those scores taken together will be a composite and form the overall impact score. So precisely just does how the review procedure work. Prior to the study section meeting, three to four reviewers will have been assigned to your grant application. Each prepares a written critique and scores for all review criteria. These critiques and scores are released a few days before the study section meeting so that all reviewers, even those not assigned to your application, can take a look at these initial reviewers reviews. At the meeting, the chair of the study section will identify what application is next to be discussed, making sure that those having a conflict of interest leave the room. Anyone who is at your institution or anyone with whom you have collaborated during the past three years are automatically declared to be in conflict. Next, reviewers one, two, and three will provide their overall impact score. They just report their number one through nine. 
Reviewer 1 then presents their critique. Reviewers 2 and 3 present any additional comments not already mentioned by the previous reviewer. The chair of the study section then asks if there are any human subjects or vertebrate animal concerns. The chair then opens up the discussion to the rest of the panel. Note that a single reviewer can easily sway the rest of the panel who often only read your project summary or your one single specific aims page. At the end of the open discussion, the chair then provides a summary of the discussion. At this point, the three assigned reviewers are asked to restate their overall final impact score. They may have changed their score after hearing the other reviewers or after the overall discussion. The score stated form the range of the score for the application, such that all reviewers are provided to score anonymously within that range. For example, suppose reviewer one had a, an overall summary score of three, reviewer two, the, an overall summary score of four, and reviewer three, an overall summary score of two. The scoring range is two to four, so all review members on the panel must score within the range from two to four. If a review panel member wants to score outside of the range, they must acknowledge that publicly and state their rationale why. These scores are then electronically recorded and also scored on a piece of paper as a backup. After the scores have been recorded, any budget concerns are brought forward. Note that budget is not a score driving factor. The chair and the scientific review officer will be asking each reviewer to make it clear in their spoken and written comments as to whether or not each application has a strong or solid scientific pre premise, whether there's a high level of rigor in the methods, and whether the investigators have adequ adequately addressed sex as a biological um, variable. So strangely, um, I've even served on study panels where a, an investigator proposed to study prostate cancer and the scientific review officer at the end of the discussion wanted to know if sex as a biological variable was adequately addressed. Of course, women don't have a prostate. Um, it's just that the SRO is trying to be thorough in their job and they will ask this for every application. New guidelines regarding NIH's initiative to enhance reproducibility through rigor and transparency can be found at this website. Of course, whoops. Of course, this initiative has prompted statisticians to use tools like R Markdown or StatTag for statistical analysis, which is why we have focused on report writing using R Markdown in this course. Links to those relevant tools are provided here. For an RO3 application, the absolute score matters. For example, in the past, the National Cancer Institute has funded RO3 applications receiving a 25 or lower. Note that the overall average score um, by all reviewers is multiplied by 10, such that although initially scored on a scale from one to nine, once average and multiplied by 10, the scoring range actually reported goes from 10 to 90. The National Library of Medicine has funded RO3s re receiving a score of 30 or lower. So note that the pay lines varies by funding institute. For most other applications like R21s or RO1s, the absolute score does not matter so much, but rather the percentile is what is, forms the basis of whether or not the grant is funded. For a given study section, this round of reviews and the previous two rounds of reviews are put together to determine the percentile of this using this formula. So that concludes our discussion of study design and NIH grant applications and scoring methodologies.